have been many huge, memorable moments on stage in rock, and sometimes they're memorable for all the wrong reasons. Here's a look at 10 crazy on-stage meltdowns in rock. It feels like every few months now we hear about a big band or artist losing it on stage and to the horror and anger of fans who paid a lot of money to see them perform. Instead of music, they get anything from a hissy fit to absolute carnage. So in this video, we're gonna go over some memorable meltdowns. Just to clarify, this is not a top 10. It's a list of bad behavior. Also, only one band or artist per entry. Otherwise, it would just be an entire list of Guns N' Roses meltdowns. Yes, Guns N' Roses does make this video. I promise it's coming. You know how these videos work. Let's get to it. Both as the lead singer of Stained and on his own solo tours, Aaron Lewis is no stranger to voicing his anger at someone or an entire crowd if he sees fit. Some of those outbursts have been more than warranted when Lewis would see people getting hurt or acting out. Other times, well... I'm sorry, I don't know how to speak Spanish. I'm American. Aaron Lewis has problems. The man had a solo show in Texas back in February of 2019, performing some of Stain's hits acoustically and some of his own country hits. He's a little bit country, a little rock and roll, and a little bit racist. It was in Texas due to the crowd being too loud. Repeat, people at a concert were too loud, and he decided to stop the show. When a fan suggested that he ask the crowd to be quiet in Spanish, he replied with saying, I'm sorry, I don't know how to speak Spanish, I'm American. It's all right, baby! And he stood there like a spoiled brat expecting everyone to stay quiet, including holding his finger up to his mouth like a librarian. He then took off the guitar and left. This is a man who has played huge festival shows. He should know how to play to a loud crowd and how to deal with it. And by dealing with it like a passive aggressive preschool teacher trying to shush all the children, he proved that he has some serious problems. Stain is making their big return later this year at two big festivals in the United States, Louder Than Life and Aftershock. I hope that this is what helps the man snap out of it, get focused back on performing for people, and not lashing out in terrible ways. Especially if he can't handle a loud crowd anymore, because that crowd at Aftershock will be his nightmare. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Wes Scantlin, he has seen some rough times over the last decade. It was over the past few years it feels like Wes was in the news repeatedly for run-ins with the law and having one nightmare show after another. Puddle of Mud was a big deal in the very early 2000s, but after that, they really fell by the wayside, and no matter who it was playing with Wes on stage, it always turned out to be a disaster. There were many meltdowns to be chosen from for Scantlin and Puddle of Mud, but the one I'm going with for this video happened back in 2016 in the UK. It was your typical show on paper in a nice club with two opening bands, but according to reports from fans and news outlets in Doncaster, West wasn't in any state to perform and only got worse as it went on. The band played for over 30 minutes, but in that time, West was rambling stories off and was hard to understand, and then made jokes about being high on crack. This was one of the many meltdowns where the band left him on stage, but Wes decided to stay a little bit longer, take his shirt off, have a seat, and sit there, quietly, just glaring at the crowd. There are several cell phone videos from this show out there just recording him sitting there on stage, glaring at everyone, as if to say, yep, this is my life, but it beats a real job. From what reports say, Scantland is now sober and back on track with new music and Mudfest. Here's hoping he can keep up that good work and stay clean because we do not need any more of this. That was my Wes, band. Fuck you, Wes! Fuck you! Has, uh, ah, went fuck on you, me. Wes! Fuck you! Fuck you, Wes! Stop fuck you! Playing with me. Fuck you! Fuck you, Wes! Is that not a surprise? Fuck you! So when people think of Queens of the Stone Age, they normally don't think of a wild lead singer with crazy meltdowns, but Josh Homme has had quite a few, and at the end of 2017, he had a wild one. During the performance, Homme, who said he was lost in the performance... Lost in the performance means drunk. There's no other way to say it. The act that most people remember from this disaster is that Hami, while smiling, backed up to the photographers in the photo pit and kicked one of the photographer's cameras back into her face. That is messed up. The photographer would have to go to get medical treatment that night. Along with all that, Josh also intentionally cut his own forehead to bleed on stage during his performance, when he also told the crowd to take off their pants and then insulted Muse, who were the headliners of that festival that night. There is so much to unpack in this Queens of the Stone Age meltdown. I mean, I can't imagine how 
how horrified the front two rows of people were seeing all this up close. This is behavior that drunks at Waffle House at two in the morning wouldn't even do. Yikes. Last night at a Queens of the Stone Age performance, um, I kicked the camera of a photographer and that camera hit the photographer in the face and the photographer's name was Chelsea Lauren. Um, I'd just like to apologize to Chelsea Lauren. I don't have any excuse or reason um, to justify what I did. I was a total dick and, uh, and I'm truly sorry and I hope you're okay. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and last night was definitely one of them. As of this video, things are going much smoother for him and he hasn't been kicking photographers or cutting his face since. Wow, I can't believe I said that. Here's hoping he stays on that wagon because this meltdown was terrifying. This was a meltdown that was brought up a few months ago on the podcast that rocked, and it's a miracle no one was sent to the hospital. Back in 2012, the Ataris were playing a show in New Jersey, and the singer Chris Rowe had a bit of a problem with drummer Rob. So how did the two gentlemen try to work out their problems? One of them tries to murder the other one with his own instruments. When it was time to perform, Felicetti had been reportedly drunk on stage and was so far gone that he couldn't really do his job. It was affecting the band's performance, and I get that, but that's when Rogue went nanners, picking up drums and cymbal stands at his own guitar just to hurl at the inebriated drummer. Rogue then took to the mic saying he would finish the set himself. My drummer's failing it tonight. I don't know what the problem is, but I'm gonna finish the set for myself. I'll play a few songs, whatever you wanna hear, but I can't. Sorry, sorry. And then the drummer tried to get back and more drums were thrown at him. It was madness. There was an interview done the day after where the Ataris talked about how the drummer was out of control and in no shape to play that night and what happened on stage was just rock and roll. That's an explanation, I guess. I can't even imagine the horror of some of the younger concert goers there. Like if they had been to that many shows at the time and they just thought this was part of the whole experience. That's crazy. But it's also Asbury Park, New Jersey, so to be fair, that probably is casual weekend behavior. Most people who have been to a concert have seen a musician play while drinking. Sometimes it goes too far, but no matter how bad it gets, for the love of God, don't try to murder your band members with their own instruments. <laughs> Asking Alexandria have gone through a lot of changes, highs, lows, and crazy moments in their storied career. The Brits have kept a die-hard fanbase through it all, even when that fanbase is getting physically attacked by the lead singer during a concert. Metalcore bands got a little wild on stage in the early 2010s, and Daddy Warsnop, who was already in a bad spot, dove headfirst into trouble. <laughs> In Seattle, Warstop was intoxicated, dove into the fans from the stage, and started swinging at people. It took a while for him to get back up as some people tried to enter the fight and others recoiled away. Once he finally got back on stage, it was more of a mess. After a lot of back and forth discussion between the band, Warstop eventually left and Ben Bruce addressed the crowd about the situation and that Danny needed help and to please keep supporting the band. I have to say, for asking Alexandria, the rest of the band tried to keep the peace after such a mess and that situation could have been much more of a disaster. Danny's my best friend, no matter what, but I know, I know he's been a bit of a cop right now. If I can ask you guys to please, 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 please support us and support him while we send him through fucking rehab and get his life back on fucking track. Yeah! Since then, Warstop has apologized and this event was the catalyst for him to get help. Eight years later, Warstop's back with Asking Alexandria and everything appears to be fine. Sometimes you gotta hit rock bottom before things get better, and if no one was truly hurt and this helped Warsop realize the damage he was doing to himself, then maybe a meltdown like this was what he needed. Though punching fans might be going too far, I would not recommend that in a solution to anything. <laughs> There have unfortunately been several meltdowns featuring five-figure death punches Ivan Moody. Whether that's telling a packed house that he's quitting the band mid-set, or having issues just getting on stage, there are a few to choose from over the years, and it's unfortunate. 
All monster energy chugging jokes aside, going to a Five Finger Death Punch show from 2016 to 2018 was always a crapshoot because you never knew if you were going to get a good show, a bad show, or any show at all. The specific moody meltdown I want to address happened in the end of 2016 where many reports and cell phone videos surfaced of Ivan Moody being clearly unable to perform at full potential, addressing the crowd with terrible news that his mother was passing away, and it was a very long day for him. He chose to be there at the show instead of being with family, but couldn't continue and the show was cut after eight songs. I had a really long day. I know. My mother, my mother, is actually passing along today. What the fuck? In his address all about this, he went to complain about TMZ, promised to refund tickets, and then talked more about his mother. But there's a bit of a problem. His mother wasn't dying. No one was. He made that up. It's been years, and I still can't even think of a proper analogy to compare this behavior to. Interviews came out 24 hours later, including with Ivan's sister saying that their mother was fine and that Ivan had been drunk and used the made-up excuse for his performance and behavior that night, and possibly a way to get off stage. 24 hours after that, he would go on to play and have another huge rant on stage about TMZ and then had to be helped off by staff. Fans recorded that as well, saying he looked completely wasted. As of this writing, Ivan Moody is reportedly over a year sober, and that is fantastic. Whether he needs a handler on the road or support at home or whatever, let's hope he continues to work with what keeps him away from alcohol. Five Finger Death Punch has a fan base and those fans don't want to be lied to and have their see their front man have a total breakdown on stage like this. I know the one thing my mother always loved. She liked to wash it all the way. This one isn't so much of a meltdown as it is disgusting, but it does lead to a similar result as the others. Back in 2010, Kings of Leon were playing in St. Louis and apparently something about the performance did not sit well with the wildlife in the area. People made jokes back at the time about, oh man, their music's so bad they even Mother Nature crapped all over it. Well, I don't know if the birds hated it that much, but they definitely crapped all over the band. After only a few songs into their set, several pigeons flew into the amphitheater and defecated on the band members, with some excellent aim, I might add. In the video, you can actually see drummer Nathan Followill wipe off his face, and then singer Caleb Followill use a towel wiping off his face after a song. What happened after that? Nothing. Literally, the band didn't finish the show claiming difficulties. It was a toxic environment after that for two reasons. One, Toxic bird poo everywhere. Number two, the crowd turned hard on Kings of Leon after realizing they paid money only to get a few songs. They played three songs and now they just announced that they're quitting. Free fun, free fun, free fun. I totally get stopping the show if animals poop on you while you're playing. Nasty. But. Take some time to wipe yourself off, hose yourself down, and then get back on stage. That's part of rock and roll and metal. Now if animals repeatedly crap on you, then you know it's a sign to stop performing. The reason I include this on the list is because the band refused to continue after cleaning up and expected people to go home. No refund. That is messed up. Whether it's nature, equipment failure, or Kings of Leon just not wanting to play, it looks like their fans at the time were left wanting. And now Kings of Leon is becoming a distant memory. Pigeon Gate was a real thing. Gross. Also, Kings of Leon screwed over their fans. Gross. <laughs> Speaking of gross. Back in the early 90s, L7 were one of the many punk rock bands to come up alongside the grunge movement. And they had a unique sound and a good following, but they were most famous for the insanity that happened at Reading Festival in 1992. At the start of L7's set, there were technical difficulties which caused a delay. The fans who were waiting in the rain and mud weren't too happy about that, and when you have a large mob of drunk, unhappy people with an endless supply of mud to stand in, nothing good will come of it. Mud was thrown on stage during L7's first song, the band were getting hit, things were bad. That's when Danita Sparks escalated things to a point where I don't think anyone was prepared for. After having enough of the unruly crowd, the front woman went behind an amp set, stuck her hand down her shorts, removed her tampon, and then got on the mic while holding said object and shouted, Alright, I got a little present for y'all! <laughs> Eat 
my used tampon, fuckers. And then flung the used item into the crowd. There's nothing I can say to add to this, you. When asked about this later, Sparks stated, I needed to amuse myself. I announced that I was throwing it, and I remember a silence afterward. A lot of people reached for it. I guess they didn't hear what I said. Then it came back on stage. It landed on the monitor ledge. I didn't see it again until I saw Nick Cave said after hours. My tampon was stuck on the monitor ledge. A roadie eventually got rid of it. That poor roadie. Wow. Talk about going above and beyond for your job. I get that dealing with a rowdy crowd is rough, but I totally consider it a meltdown. When you get so mad, you pull out you sanitary items to hurl back at said crowd. That's a meltdown in behavior in any setting too, not just on stage. Eat my used tampon, fuckers. Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day has had some wild moments for both good and bad. Green Day's live show sometimes has hugs with fans on stage, and other times things just boil over. Back in 2012, after the not so well received trilogy of albums Uno Dos and Trey, the punk icons were performing on the iHeart Radio Festival, which is a multi genre music event at best, but in reality, it leads toward the poppiest of bubblegum pop. So, what happens when a legendary punk band doesn't get the respect they deserve? They make sure everyone knows about it. Green Day was given a shorter set time than some of the popular acts like Usher, and then that big sign that had a countdown to let them know they only had one minute left, and part of their set had to include Basket Case at the end, really set off Armstrong. That song ended early so Billy could address how Green Day has been around since 1988 and demands respect. There, there, look at that fucking sign right there. One minute. Let me fucking tell you something. Let me tell you something. I've been around since fucking 1980 fucking eight. What the fuck? I'm not fucking Justin Bieber, you motherfuckers. After making sure everyone knew how much garbage it was that Green Day only got one minute, Billy used that time to string together some profanity about his treatment and then smash his guitar. And then Mike looked at Billy and went, Hey, that looks like fun, and joined him in the instrument breaking. I'm still not sure how, but I blame the Uno, Dos, and Trey albums for this meltdown. I'm pretty sure they could cause that. This meltdown was the tipping point for Armstrong and would check himself into rehab shortly after, and that's a good thing. Since then, Green Day has gotten back on track, released a solid album in Revolution Radio, and hasn't gone ballistic at a production crew who were just doing their job. Everyone is better, and it's a happy ending. One minute. God fucking love you all. We'll be back. I had to include an Axl Rose story in this video, come on. Of the many wild stories about Guns N' Roses frontman in the 80s and 90s, I wanted to end this video with one of the biggest onstage meltdowns I've ever heard of. All the way back to 1991 in St. Louis, Missouri, in a brand new venue called Riverport Amphitheater, Axl Rose christened this new concert venue by inciting a riot. Literally a riot. Everyone lost their mind, including Axl. More so than usual. I know today it's not a big deal to see a wall of cell phones from the crowd taking photos and video of a band, but back in 91, this was not common, and some musicians were not a fan of having their photos taken. At least one fan would not stop taking photos of Mr. Rose, and Mr. Rose lost it. Mid-song. He brought the show to a grinding halt and demanded security stop the man with the camera. The fan wasn't stopped, so in one of his many famous sentences, Axel said on the mic, I'll take it, God damn it. He then dove into the crowd to rip the camera away from the man. After a clear punch to said fan that was caught on camera by Guns N' Roses' own crew, Axel climbed back on stage, blamed security, said, I'm going home, and smashed his microphone on the ground. Slash then got on the mic saying, he just smashed his microphone. We're out of here. Well, thanks to the lame ass security, I'm going home. St. Louis did not take that well. Those seats became launchable objects to help start a riot. Axel even said a man with a knife got on stage after. The venue became destroyed and over 40 people were injured. Flying chairs destroyed property and Axel Rose getting charged with inciting a riot that would take over a year to finally settle. There have been a few documentaries made about the riot in St. Louis and Guns N' Roses' hatred towards St. Louis because of this event. If you want to check one of them out, it's in the YouTube cards here. 
Honestly, it's worth it to watch Axl Rose dive into the crowd, throw a few punches, climb back up, and smash his microphone. And that's when everything just breaks open. Guns N' Roses would not return to St. Louis until 2017. That's 26 years later. And for what it's worth, it looks like everything that happened back then is now in the past. Guns N' Roses is on tour this year, Slash and Duffer back with Axel, and no more riots. Or at least I hope not. We don't need any more riots and destroyed venues. Or racist Aaron Lewis comments. Or shirtless West Scantlands. Rock and roll, everyone. And that was a look at 10 crazy onstage meltdowns in rock. Which one was your favorite? Is there a meltdown you want to point out that's not on this list? Leave a comment, let everyone know. Huge thanks to my patrons and a special thank you to Brandon Berenfeld. You can help support Rock and have a say in upcoming videos, including the next Regretting the Past and album reviews by becoming a patron. More info on the link in the YouTube card and description below. Please subscribe, it helps a ton to get noticed in YouTube search rankings and you'll get notified of upcoming videos. You can check out my concert photography on Instagram and you can keep up to date with Rock on Facebook. Facebook and Twitter.